we hear from Jamika. So uh, you've all been waiting for this. She's going to take us on a tour of the transit system, apparently. So I hope you've got your bags packed and you're ready to travel. Uh, so Jamika, I think if you unmute yourself, there you are. I will turn it over to you, my friend. We're just Thank so you. thankful to have you. Your passion for myeloma is unparalleled. And uh, please navigate us through this multiple myeloma transit system. The floor is yours. Thank you. And I'm excited to navigate through this transit system today and to share with you today. You can go to the next slide, please. I want to start with sharing that um, my myeloma journey reminded me of the days that I traveled throughout Metro Atlanta using MARTA, which is our transit system here. The acronym for MARTA uh, is Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. And Metro Rapid Transit Authority stood out because this journey really does force you to select a path amongst many options as you heard today. Um, it can appear to move rapidly and it takes you many places physically and emotionally as you've heard today. And although you're not in the myeloma driver's seat, you always have the authority of when you get on and off a treatment path. So as we said, let's go ahead and take Marta for a few minutes. And today that is Myeloma's African-American Rapid Transit Authority and discuss a few aspects that impacted me the most as I transitioned from being healthy to living with myeloma starting at a young age. You can go to the next one. Now, this slide gives just a little bit of a snapshot of my journey. I was diagnosed at 26, and some of my symptoms were extreme pain, nausea, vomiting. At one point, I couldn't even hold down a glass of water. That led to kidney failure and my first hospitalization on Thanksgiving Day, which lasted about three weeks. My next appointment landed me in the ambulance, ER, and back in a hospital room. I was diagnosed with hypoglycemia. My levels were so high that they said that I should have been in a coma or dead. That hospitalization lasted three months. So I spent Christmas, New Year's, and Valentine's Day in the hospital. Finally, my journey to remission ended with about a month hospitalization during my stem cell transplant. That treatment was using my own cells and my parting gift from that hospitalization was losing my hair and three inches in height. Um, a patient as young as I was was so uncommon that as you see, my radiology report says that it's most likely myeloma, although the patient age argues against multiple myeloma. One other thing that's a bit unique about my journey is that I'm about two years shy of a decade with myeloma being under control without relapse or maintenance therapy. You can go to the next slide. The trauma from being so young um, in 99 and just getting started building my career when I was diagnosed so late in the game and with the cancer that I never heard of made life difficult. But along the routes that I took, I learned that life goes on. Losing so many things at once is something you must mourn, and there are stages to grief. And to create joy, I needed help to keep my spirits up, and my community was in my corner. Next slide. These maps um, of MARTA system shows what happens when you map out your best route. So from 2003 to 2020, you see the difference in how the clutter is on one side versus the other. So just think about how different a ride is when you know how to get to your destination and when you don't. And in my case, as I moved through my stages of grief, I felt the lyrics from a Mary J. Blige song, because of my loma, I've been up and I've been down, I've been wealthy and I've been poor. As you talk about, we have medical expenses and things of that nature. But I learned that if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And to navigate your way sometime, it does take an A, B, C, and D plan. Next slide. During my three month hospitalization, I jotted things down. And these are a few pages from my um, journal during that time. And when my doctor changed one of my IV prescriptions treating my hypercalcemia, a nurse tried to administer the old prescription, but my notes helped to resolve that misunderstanding. 
Now with the patient portal, I don't have to write as many things down, but I still do use a medical journey when I'm dealing with several providers and diagnoses at once. And here's a little bit. I try to always keep a journal with a positive message on it. And I also use tabs for each diagnosis and provider that I see. I also carry this little notepad. Um, I keep this in my wallet. So when things pop up in my mind on the fly or I get an unexpected medical call, I can still jot those things down and then put it in my journal or my notes later. Um, again, I have examples. You always want to keep track of your provider, your conditions, your medical history, track your symptoms and uh, any questions that you have. And so that's how those tabs can help you in that area. Next slide, please. Now, the memories and pictures that you see here, they remind me that my survivorship is not all about me, especially when I battle with those feelings of wanting to throw in the towel. And listen, helping others is its own reward system. I have you ever noticed that when someone smiles at you, it's really hard to resist smiling back. Someone's ability to make it can come from sharing your routes during a support group meeting, sending a letter to your house of representative or senator that lowers drug tear costs, raising money that is used to develop initiatives like this one, or sharing myeloma information that leads to early diagnosis and treatment by more primary care physicians. Next slide. Now, here in Atlanta, Five Point Station is the center of all train routes. Anywhere you want to go to, you can get to from Five Points. And your wellness team, your PCP, your oncologist, and supportive care provider is the center to all your treatment routes. Just determine who manages what and for how long. At a certain point after my transplant, it, if it wasn't related to myeloma, my primary care doctor handled it, not my oncologist. Things, the source of your information also matters when you're advocating for screenings, diagnosis, and your treatment course. So your wellness team helps you to navigate that as well. Now, things can come up, um, and my oncologist referred me to supportive care. And when that happened, I learned that they stood in the gap between my primary care doctor and my oncologist. And because my doctor, Kersine, and my supportive care team cared for my overall well-being, then they also provided more of my needs in a systematic setting. Um, and then they also, as um, Sharice talked about, provided complementary theory, um, therapy referrals for me as well. And that was very helpful. Next slide, please. Now you'll find that some routes that I took, I needed to transfer from a train route into a bus route. And treating my loma and staying healthy is similar. You may have to transfer, as I mentioned before, from one provider to another, or you may be under multiple providers care. Using continuity of care, linking your medical care teams and facilities will make that process easier for you. You save time, money and decrease frustrations. I really love this part of the medical field when I go to urgent care because they I don't have to pull out paperwork, sign paperwork. I don't show my ID or insurance card or even have to give my pharmacy information. Having your healthcare data across one to three system also help when you're dealing with the disability process and need to submit or release medical records. Speaking of the disability system, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, so do your research, read all the fine print and policies, know who you can turn to if you have any issues prior to the start of the process, especially when you're dealing with workers' comp, short-term and long-term disability, and the social security disability insurance processes. I went through so many changes learning it could take years to be approved. So please be prepared for denials, document and resolve issues using the proper chain of command. And you might need to transfer some things over to a higher authority and that could be an attorney or a government oversight agency. Next, please. Now as Sharice and a lot of other doctors talk about there is a financial aspect to your care as a patient. And to start a route, 
any train system you have, you have to pay a fee. Here, we have to pay martyr's fee. To start your recovery, you have medical costs. Now, those of us who are in a middle income, this can be an especial struggle for us because a lot of systems can use the previous year income. You can have too high income to qualify, but not enough income to cover your medical expenses, plus your cost of living. It's a fact that stress causes pain and pain causes stress. So you can see how these things link, um, but you have to break this cycle in order to survive. So financial support programs that cover some of these medical expenses, again, speaking with a social worker and seeking help from a government and nonprofit agencies like the IMF can help you with that. There are resources, again, as you've heard on myloma.org, the Empower Atlanta, myloma.org website, and also you can simply call the IMF info line. And I also want you guys to also remember they have a lot of YouTube videos and um, different videos on their site as well that you can view. Next slide, please. Now, sometimes when I wrote MARTA, I had many options to get to the same destination. Now, we have two options when we're communicating with our providers these days. You can call them or you can use the patient portal. For me, the 24 hour access to the provider and being able to send anything at any time, uh, having access to your medical records and early uh, access to even um, diagnosis uh, testing and things of that nature is very helpful when it comes to using the patient portal. I also uh, love a new technology they have, which is telehealth being able to schedule virtual visits instead of in-person visits and appointments, knocking out having to travel and wait in the waiting room, especially when you don't feel well, or it's just a follow-up appointment can lock you into using telehealth uh, with a lot of your providers. And using these tools can also, again, lower your expenses so that you can take care of some other things. So if you find that it's difficult to jump onto using these technologies, please allow someone to help you out with that. Next slide, please. Now, when I knew that I had to go from one side of Atlanta to the other side, and it was gonna be a lengthy route, a lot of times I would take a book or I would download my favorite playlist to listen to. You need to prepare for your recovery. It is a lengthy journey that affects your mental health. My good friend Tahira told me a while back that my brain was an organ that was affected by my diagnosis and it also needed healing. Cognitive therapy has been a surprising source for my recovery. And this is a referral that I got through supportive care. The tools that I've learned like using the PEG word systems and acronyms like WAPR, which stands for writing things down, organizing it, then picturing it, and then rehearsing that. Um, to recall information like appointments and schedules has been great. Uh, one of the tools, for example, that I've learned and I've been using a lot is to associate uh, numbers with words. So I associate hero with the number zero, and then I picture Black Panther for my hero. And then Kevin with the number 11, and I picture Kevin Hart. And so when I need to remember an appointment is for 11 o'clock, I picture Kevin Hart fist bumping Black Panther, and that helps me to stay on track. So again, these are very helpful with you, uh, minimizing frustrations and being able to make sure that you're staying on top of your appointments as well. Next slide, please. Your mindset, your attitude, and that financial security, it really does have a direct impact on your healing process. So I want you to remember that you have to break that cycle. And talking through your challenges with the right person is a key to making that happen. Now, I want you to think about when you're lost and you stop and ask for direction and the person starts to hem and hawn and saying, um, as they give you the directions, you know the feeling that you get about following those directions, right? So I want you to know that you'll really find out along your route that learning as you go and relying on your advocates, reinforcements, your community resources, it truly does ease that burden of, and that feeling of being lost as you go along the way. And please remember that the source of the information matters. 
particularly when advocating for your needs, your medical rights, and considering drug trials. Next slide, please. Well, we have reached our destination. I hope you will navigate and map out your model route with more clarity. One final thought that I do want to leave you with is when it gets really tough, think about what you're going through is for another patient. It could be for a caregiver, a family member, or a friend of a myeloma patient. Try also to remember that surviving trauma from your diagnosis and treatment course can bless your community. It can bless your very neighbor. I had a neighbor that moved across the street that was diagnosed with myeloma and the ability I had to share with her and my journey with her was amazing. So it truly can bless your very neighbor. And I wanna thank you for allowing me to share this information with you today. Well, oh, thank you, Jamika. I could listen to you all day. I mean, you are not just a blessing to your neighbor, you're a blessing to so many people. It, it almost chokes me up just thinking about how much you've done and how many people you've helped. Uh, just listening to that story, you know, I'm the guy who's always using analogies. I've met my match here. And not to mention that somehow Kevin Hart and Black Panther made it into this power empower workshop. It's pretty <laughs> impressive. So, so thank you so much for your passion, your expertise, and your meticulous detail in describing that Marta system. That was really, really a brilliant uh, method. I know we only have about five minutes left, but I think we can take a few of these questions. I see the panels come back and join us, which is great. So this is a little bit like the rapid fire round, everybody. So, so quick answers, if we can, uh, would be really helpful. Uh, Dr. Blue, is it possible to have myeloma and not have bone lesions? Yes, of course. Um, that happens very commonly. As again, bone lesions are only one of the other reasons. You got to think about it. Other things that we look for are kidney problems or kidney uh, injury. Other things that we look for are what they call anemia. Uh, people can also have problems with uh, calcium. Um, so those are the main things that happen, but bones is only one component. And for sure, there's many patients that actually do not have bone disease, uh, but it is something that we do watch out because once those bone disease do happen, unfortunately, they are painful sometimes and impair your quality of life. Absolutely. That very well said. Uh, so, um, uh, Sharice, here's a good question for you uh, that comes and says, uh, what is the best way to reestablish a healthy microbiome after transplant? Yeah, we talked about that. I, I mentioned that a little bit because I had seen that. So, you know, after transplant, after having antibiotics, you know, you can really lose that. So diarrhea, alternating with constipation, that kind of thing. So advancing your diet to that diversity of diet, right? Eating things, more things like beans and fruit, things that have fiber, um, legumes, um, and just, you know, that more of that Mediterranean type diet that can help with that. We get a lot of questions about probiotics post-transplant, and I would recommend that you talk to your team about that. We usually allow um, some probiotic use after, you know, a little further out around day 100 or so post-transplant um, that can help restore that as well, but really paying attention to what you're feeding yourself, because remember that's your energy as well. Absolutely. Great, uh, great answer. Uh, uh, Ajay, um, are there trials for patients with smoldering myeloma? Absolutely. We do have two ongoing trials at this point. One is a trial called the it's an ECOG trial called the DETER. So DETER, small to multiple myeloma, randomizing patients to lenalidomide dexamethasone versus daratumab lenalidomide dexamethasone. And both of them are acceptable treatments. There is nothing called placebo that, we, that, that are used in these trials. The second trial that we have is called ibotamide, which is the new drug that I showed you. This is a fourth generation immunomodulatory agent. And it is very powerful in terms of its activity against myeloma. Here we are using it in smoldering myeloma setting. There's a randomization here with dexamethasone or without dexamethasone, but that's for a very short period of time. Effective trials that we have in place. Great. Yeah. So we are exploring smoldering myeloma, the sort of the pre-myeloma, should we intervene earlier? And Emory has actually been one of the leading sites in the world in this area. Here's a question I'll take quickly. 
um, it's it's sad, very sad, really, where the person is asking, you know, what has happened to the 21? I think I showed 12,000, but it was 12,000 people who die each year, even though there are so many treatments. And, and it's a sobering reminder that we have made huge progress in myeloma, but patients still die every day from this disease. I lost a few very dear patients in these last few weeks. One was a, a 34 year old woman. It was very hard for us in my clinic. And it reminds us that way, that's what propels us. I, I went into this field because I wanted to take care of the sickest of the sick. 25 years ago, when I started in myeloma, patients barely lived a year. Uh, and so I think we have to balance the optimism with the realism that we are facing some very uh, challenging times. On the other hand, uh, uh, we have definitely seen huge progress, uh, but we want to continue uh, to fight and fight very hard. I think I get to take one more question that I get to give to Jamika because I, I, I so appreciated her uh, uh, message today. And by the way, I should note that there is a Georgia myeloma support group um, that has regular now uh, virtual meetings. Um, and Nancy Bruno, one of our uh, staff is very much involved with this. So if you go again, we've said it so many times to uh, myeloma.org, you can learn more uh, about that. Uh, but Jamika, here, here's a question from someone who is saying, I'm 65 years old, just was diagnosed uh, in April of this year. I'm on my second regimen. I'm hopeful, but somewhat fearful because of the high percentage of cancer cells in my marrow. What can you say to me that can help me, quote, keep hope alive? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is that you have control over your diagnosis. So I know that usually when you're first diagnosed, you have that first feeling of, I can't control what's happening in my own body. Um, but just keep it in the forefront that you do have control over decisions that are happening, even though you don't have control over the disease itself that's in your body. Also relying on your family, friends, and community is so vital. Uh, that's the one of the first things that I learned. Um, and then one of the other things I think it, we overlook a lot of time is humor and laughter. So if you have a favorite movie that's a comedy, um, something that brings you joy, it's, it's an activity, try to do all of those things to remind you that you're living. I don't know if you guys can see, but behind me, that saying says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is your future, and today is your life, live it. So it is so important that you don't forget to live. Do whatever you can in that moment, and that will keep that hope alive for you. Thank you so much, Jamika, said with uh, such love and passion. I so appreciate it. I, I wish we could get to all the questions, but I'm very committed to finishing uh, now on time. Just a couple of final things before everybody goes. We are going to have a survey for you, uh, so please fill it out. Give us feedback. We'd love to learn. We, we make changes at each of these meetings. We've introduced the interview style, for example, uh, when I interviewed uh, Drs. Blue and Nuka, so please let us know what you think about that. Uh, you know, Give us feedback about how we can do these uh, more and more. I also want to uh, just remind everyone um, that we... Uh, can be reached 24-7 uh, online, uh, but also with the, the, the helpline, uh, the info line, which we're going to close this meeting in just a second with a brief, it's only two minutes, actually just under two minutes, video about the info line. So, so stay and watch that, uh, perhaps as you uh, fill out your feedback. Uh, and indeed, I want to thank again our sponsors who are listed on this slide, uh, without whose help this would be very challenging. So we so appreciate it. And again, I want to apologize to those who I didn't get to all the questions. It's great to see such enthusiasm around them. Uh, but please fill out the survey, watch this last video. And lastly, thank you panel. I learned from each of you today. I was touched both in my mind and my heart by each of you. I love each of you and thank you so much for your commitment to myeloma patients and to the IMF and uh, we will definitely be engaging again in the near future. So tee up the video, and I hope you enjoy this and enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we look forward to working with you all again soon. Thank you.